Now, in the event that one would want to go internally as well and say, God could have had uh, good reasons Mm -hmm. for this judgment against these pagan nations. What are our options on that? Well, I think first we need to set the framework of a theory of ethics that will help us to understand these uh, commands. And the framework for my ethical theory is what's called divine command morality. Now, what is that? Well, that is uh, an ethical theory which says that our moral duties are constituted by God's commands. It is God's commandments to us that give us right and wrong, that determine what we should and should not do. And therefore, if God issues you a command to do something, that becomes your moral duty, and it would be wrong for you not to do it. Now, since God doesn't issue commands to himself, he doesn't have any moral duties to fulfill. Rather, he simply acts in accordance with his nature, which is loving, just, kind, compassionate, and so forth. Now, in that context, what one comes to realize is that God is under no obligation whatsoever to extend anybody's life. Life is a gift from God, and he's not duty-bound to prolong your life. He can take your life as he sees fit. That's his prerogative as God. So I don't have the right as a human being to to kill somebody else. If I did that, that would be murder. But if God were to kill me right now, that wouldn't be murder. He could do that, and he wouldn't violate any moral duty that's within his prerogatives. Now, what that means in this case is that God isn't under any moral obligation to prolong the lives of the Canaanite people, even the Canaanite children. Uh, Children die all the time in, in the world from disease and accident and other sorts of things. So God isn't in any way obligated to prolong the lives of any of these Canaanite persons. If he chooses to take their lives, he does no wrong and is completely uh, within his rights in doing so. So the problem isn't that God took the lives of the Canaanites. That's, that's not really a, a difficulty. The difficulty, rather, is that he commanded the Israeli soldiers to take the lives of these Canaanites. That is, I think, the the essence of the problem. And if God were all-knowing and he had the attributes of omniscience and so forth, it wouldn't be an arbitrary thing. He would have a purpose. Yes, that's right. God is... In taking a life. His commands reflect his own moral nature and character, which is just and loving and wise, so that his commands are not issued capriciously, or arbitrarily, there would be good morally sufficient reasons for issuing a command like this. And if God were to issue a command to the soldiers to kill the Canaanite people, in virtue of divine command morality, that would become their moral duty. That would become the right thing for them to do. Now, someone might say, well, then are you saying that God can command someone to murder somebody else? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that God can command you to murder someone. I'm saying that God can command you to do something which in the absence of a divine command would have been murder, but is not murder in virtue of that divine command because it now becomes your moral duty. God has the right to command you to do things which in the absence of a command would have been sin. So think of Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac. If Abraham had done this on his own initiative, if he had just taken his son and decided to sacrifice him to God, that would have been an abomination in God's sight. But under the injunction of a divine command to sacrifice Isaac, it is no longer murder. It now becomes Abraham's moral duty, and God tests Abraham to see his faithfulness and obedience if he will carry out this terribly difficult command in obedience to God. So God gave a command to these Israeli soldiers to do something that they would not have had the right to do under their own initiative, namely to take the lives of uh, not only soldiers, other soldiers, but also civilians, women, and children. And moreover, I think we want to say that God had a morally sufficient reason for doing so. And we we see this already in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, when Abraham is confronted by God and God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember there's a story where Abraham bargains with God 
And he says, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you destroy it in that case? Won't the judge of all the earth do right? He, he challenges God with respect to, to God doing the right thing. And what is God's response? He says, if there are 50 righteous people in the city, I will not destroy it. And then Abraham says, oh, God, don't don't blame me. What if there are 40 people? And God said, I still won't destroy it if there are 40 people. And Abraham says, oh, Lord, don't think me impertinent. What if what if there are, are even 10 righteous people in the city? And God says, if there are 10 righteous in the city, I will not destroy it. And Abraham doesn't dare go any lower than that. He's, he's too afraid to bargain with God more. But this story sets the background for the destruction of the conquest of Canaan. It shows that God isn't going to destroy a nation or a people without just cause, that if there were righteous people there, he wouldn't do it. And when he predicts the bondage of Israel in Egypt, he says to Abraham that his descendants are going to go down into Egypt, and they're going to be there for 400 years because, God says, the iniquity of of the Canaanites is not yet complete. In other words, they had not yet become so corrupted, so decadent, that they were ripe for judgment. And so God stays his judgment upon Canaan for another 400 years. He allows his own people, Israel, to languish in slavery in Egypt until the iniquity of the Canaanites becomes so intolerable, so irrevocable, that now they are ripe for judgment, and he brings his people out of Israel in the Exodus and commands them to go in and destroy this nation wholesale in judgment. And in fact, the Canaanite nation and culture was incredibly decadent. They practiced temple prostitution in their worship of Baal. They even practiced child sacrifice, where they were killing innocent human beings, uh, supposedly in worship to God. And God says, these things are abominable. I want you to wipe out these people. So this isn't just sort of making room for God's people to come back into the land. Rather, these people were ripe for judgment, and so God decided to destroy them. Now, you might say, well, what about the children, though? You know, the children hadn't done anything wrong. So how could God command them to be destroyed? Well, here I think, Kevin, we need to look at the destruction of the Canaanite children in the wider context of God's commandments to Israel not to assimilate to pagan nations and practices. God gave Israel an incredibly complex law that distinguishes between clean and unclean. And some of these regulations are so bizarre to us as moderns, like don't wear cloth that's a mixture of linen and wool, or don't have milk and meat uh, cooked in the same vessel. The point of these strange and arbitrary distinctions between clean and unclean seems to be to avoid mixing things together. These are parables, as it were. They are they are living illustrations, tangible illustrations, of how you are not to assimilate to these pagan nations and peoples all around you. And so the destruction of the Canaanites wholesale, even the, the children, is just one more terrible, tangible object lesson of the the prohibition of not assimilating. They are not even to assimilate racially with these Canaanite children by allowing them to live, grow up, and intermarry with Israelis. Israel is to be reserved for God alone, set apart from him alone, and not to in any way assimilate to the peoples and nations around them. So, God has them even take the lives of the children to prevent this. Now, notice that in doing so, God doesn't do anything wrong to those children. In fact, if you believe in the salvation of infants, as I do, the destruction of these children was, in fact, their salvation. It it means that they went to heaven and went to be with God. So He He certainly spared them the rigors of the horrors of paganism. Yeah. What if they'd grown up in, in that Canaanite culture and then ultimately go to hell? And so... But at any rate, it's it's God's call. Right. You know. it, it's God's prerogative as as the divine lawgiver, and he can command people to do things that in the absence of a command would have been sin, but in the presence of a command is now their duty. He does so with good moral reason, but also he doesn't wrong the children. I mean, I think that's important to see. He does no wrong to them in doing this, 
On the contrary, it accords them salvation, eternal life, and a knowledge of God.